At the beginning of 1889, the balance in the treasury was 2141, and the official membership numbered about 70. In early March 1889, there was a congregational vote to extend a call to Miss Carolyn J. Bartlett of Sioux Falls, Dakota Territory, to occupy the pulpit at a salary of $1,000 for one year. Silas Hubbard, prominent Kalamazoo businessman, who would become a strong supporter of Carolyn, was on the board that year. The group of three church members who met her at the railroad station reportedly were not happy they had been sent a woman preacher. There were only six female ministers in the whole state of Michigan at that time. However, on the following Sunday, March 17, the Unitarian Church was full of members and non-members, eager to hear this unusual minister. She subsequently accepted the position and conducted services monthly until that September, when the duties became full-time. She was 31 years of age. Carolyn Bartlett was born August 17, 1858, in Hudson, Wisconsin, into a society under the Victorian influence, which attempted to keep women separate and inferior. However, her childhood and adolescence differed from the traditional experience of that era. She was not trained by her mother in the usual life of domesticity as most young girls were. Her father, Lorenzo Bartlett, a steamboat captain, influenced her to become scholarly, strong-willed, and devoutly religious in the traditional Protestant belief. At the Congregational Sunday School in Hudson, she studied her Bible seriously, but could not accept without question the idea that God was unjust and cruel, and she refused to believe that unbaptized infants and unbelievers would be condemned to hell. When Carolyn was in her early teens, the family moved to Hamilton, Illinois, where Carolyn attended public high school number five. She spent many hours discussing the liberal universalist religion practiced by other family members. At age 16, Carrie, as she was then called, heard a talk by Unitarian minister Oscar Clute at the town hall in Hamilton. His sermon was entitled, The Evolution of Religion. I found all my doubts and problems solved. It was like a message from heaven. Later I told my father, I am going to be a Unitarian minister. Her father was not pleased with this decision. She earned her bachelor's degree in three years from Carthage College in Illinois, where she honed her oratory skills and was valedictorian of her class. During her college years, her liberal viewpoint resulted in several conflicts with the more conservative philosophy of this Lutheran institution, but she did not back down. Her father would not finance her goal for further education at a Unitarian seminary, so for the next few years, Carolyn tried other professions. She was a public school principal for one year in Montrose, Iowa. Then she entered the journalism field as a reporter in Chicago, Minneapolis, and Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Her excellent reporting was rewarded with interviews with important people of that day, such as Mark Twain and Susan B. Anthony. She had a friendship with Susan Anthony for many years. Carolyn was one of a handful of women reporters in the country at that time. Carolyn never gave up her goal to become a Unitarian minister. By her 27th birthday, her father had re relented and even encouraged her efforts to achieve her purpose. Mary Safford and Eleanor Gordon were among a group of women Unitarian ministers who influenced her during this period. And in 1886, she was accepted as a candidate for seminary study at Meadville Theological School, a Unitarian college which was then in Pennsylvania. However, she did not attend seminary. She studied under the tutelage of Safford and Gordon, and by a special arrangement with Reverend Clute and Reverend Jenkin Lloyd-Jones, who critiqued the sermons and essays she wrote. I understand that the Unitarian body allows for all progress in belief and fixes no creed, either for its members or its ministers. What I want to do is this, in as simple a way as possible, to help such people as are in need of a rational basis for religious faith. 
and to show them that such a faith may be best won and sustained by living a rational life. While still an unordained novice, Carolyn was named Minister of the All Souls Church in Sioux Falls, Dakota Territory in January of 1887. Within 13 months, she had helped design and erect a new church building for that congregation, which grew from 70 to 250 members during her tenure. In spite of her success with that first pastorate, Carolyn resigned in January of 1889 with the intention of furthering her theological studies at the Chicago Theological Seminary. When the Western Unitarian Conference heard of her plans, the General Secretary John Effinger persuaded her to help the troubled First Unitarian Society of Kalamazoo by preaching weekends. Upon arriving in Kalamazoo, which was then a city of nearly 23,000 that summer of 1889, Carolyn made the decision to postpone her plans for study in Chicago. There was a greater need to rejuvenate the church to which she had been called. She quickly organized cleanup and fix-up crews to landscape the grounds, do minor renovations in the building, and at the same time oversee the music and choir choices and order new hymnals. There was some opposition to the changes she wished to make, but her sermons won people over. Church bulletins were placed in the Kalamazoo post office, hotels, railroad stations, and courthouse to advertise the Sunday service, which shortly grew to both morning and evening events. By January of 1890, there were 94 families attending regularly and contributing. 25 of these families were not on the books before she arrived. In October of 1889, Carolyn was ordained and installed at the Michigan Unitarian Conference held in Kalamazoo with Reverend Jenkins Lloyd-Jones giving the main address. Jones was one of the most unfailingly staunch supporters of women ministers in the Unitarian Church in that era. That first year in Kalamazoo, she also served as a co-pastor of the Grand Rapids Unitarian Church, sharing responsibility with Iowa sister Marion Murdoch. Carolyn and Marion shared an apartment in Kalamazoo. At the Kalamazoo Church, Bartlett's community-oriented ministry was patterned after Reverend Jones's concept of a seven-day church, which was open for community activities, not just on Sunday. She told the congregation, this church cannot be a place where we are merely to come together once a week and enjoy our doctrine and congratulate ourselves that we have a faith free from superstition. We must do something for others as well as for ourselves. And the more we have done for others, the more, in the end, we shall find we have done for ourselves. In January of 1891, a change was made which is still in effect at Peoples to this day. The congregation voted to discontinue passing contribution boxes during the service. Instead, they were placed in the foyer. After only a year and a half as minister in Kalamazoo, Carolyn resigned from the church to travel in Europe for the purpose of studying social conditions there. She was replaced by her co-pastor, Miss Murdoch, who, after three months at the helm, decided to return to school. Bartlett was persuaded by the Board of Trustees to return to Kalamazoo in late August 1891 to resume the pastorate. She seemed energized and confident after her contact with the charities, social agencies, and other liberal ministers in Europe. Her annual salary on her return was $1,200, plus expenses. Minutes of the congregational meeting on January 1st, 1892, show that the Sunday School, Ladies' Society, and all departments of the church were growing steadily. On April 10, 1892, Carolyn proposed a new bond of union to the congregation. A committee of 10 members was selected to review the document, which had no reference to Christianity. Some of the wording was borrowed from resolutions offered at the 1886 Western Unitarian Conference. It read, Earnestly desiring to develop in ourselves and in the world honest, reverent thought, faithfulness to our highest conception of right living, the spirit of love and service to all people, and allegiance towards all the interests of morality and religion, as interpreted by the growing thought and purest lives of humanity. We join ourselves together, hoping to help one another in all good things, and to 
advance the cause of pure and practical religion in the community. We base our union on no creed test, but upon the purpose herein expressed, and welcome all who wish to join us to help establish truth, righteousness, and love in all the world. The following Sunday, April 17, 1892, the congregation approved the new bond of union unanimously. There have been only minor changes in the wording since that day. The church continued to have difficulties in meeting its financial commitments and frequently had to borrow money from local banks and from the more affluent members according to the minutes of the trustees' meetings. Bartlett continued to promote the seven-day church with social programs for all people, regardless of race, color, or creed. The church soon began to outgrow its building, and meetings were being held at the Academy of Music, a larger structure. Bartlett's closest friend in Kalamazoo at that time was Carolyn Hubbard, member of the church and daughter of Silas Hubbard. Mr. Hubbard donated $20,000 toward the construction of a new building. I am inspired to make the donation because this church has influenced me to give up tobacco and alcohol, which has probably saved me twice the amount of my gift. Another stipulation went with Silas Hubbard's donation, that the name be changed. So, on April 2, 1894, the congregation voted unanimously to change the name from the First Unitarian Society of Kalamazoo to People's Church. A lot was purchased at the corner of South Park and Lovell Streets. An architect was hired. Carolyn designed the inside of the building and asked the architect to put a shell around her design according to her institutional church pamphlet. On June 25th, 1894, the corner name stone was laid with a box containing the bond of union, names of all current members, and other pertinent items. Even though the country was in the depths of a financial depression during this period, an additional $15,000 was raised. Among other fundraisers, five concerts were held by People's Choir during the year to raise money for completion of the new building and its furnishings. A new organ, costing $2,300, was donated by Mr. and Mrs. Henry F. Blount of Washington, D.C. Mrs. Blount had been a pupil of Lucinda Hinsdale Stone at Kalamazoo College. Mrs. Stone was a good friend of Carolyn Bartlett, and all three were like-minded in their belief in liberal religion. The Blounts gave the new organ in memory of their daughter. This same organ and pipes were moved to the New People's Church building at 1758 North 10th Street in Kalamazoo, where it is still in use today. The old organ was given to Reverend Clark Howland for his church in Lawrence, Kansas. He had been minister during the years of 1865 to 1881. Sadly, Silas Hubbard died two months before the church was completed. On December 16, 1894, a dinner was held for the workmen and their wives, the building committee and guests from out of town, to celebrate completion of the project. Participating in the dedication of the new building were Reverend A. N. Alcott, Reverend Clark Howland, Reverend Jenkin Lloyd Jones, and Marion Murdoch. The sanctuary held 700 people with parlors in the back. It was decided to rent the old church building to various organizations and a mortgage was taken on it to pay for the balance owed on the new structure. The old building was sold in 1902 for $2,500. Programs instituted during Carolyn's ministry were a free public kindergarten, one of the first in Michigan. This was open to the community. A women's gymnasium program. The equipment was provided by a donation from Mrs. Silas Hubbard. The program was supervised by trained physical education directors and children were included. The local YMCA already had an excellent men's program.
literary club named the Frederick Douglass Club. They met in a parlor named in his honor. It provided educational opportunities for blacks in Kalamazoo. After about a year, black churches in town took over this organization. Also, a course in Eastern religions. This was taught by Carolyn Bartlett herself. In 1897, Carolyn added two more classes to the already busy schedule. The first was a school of household science. 90 women students were taught cooking, housekeeping, home nursing, and sewing skills. The teachers were vocational school graduates from Chicago. Carolyn also took the course, which helped her prepare for her later role as a municipal housekeeping consultant. And finally, a manual training class for men. The men were taught carpentry and other trades. Carolyn said that an additional benefit of this class was to keep young men off the streets at night. In January of 1896, an important event occurred. Colonel Robert Ingersoll, the foremost critic of Christian theology, came to speak in Kalamazoo. Bartlett invited him to visit People's Church and to hear her sermon. He later stated to the press, Well, I must say, I think it is the finest thing in your state, if not in the nation. If there were a church like this in my hometown, and its members would permit it, I would join it. For weeks, there was great controversy in Kalamazoo and throughout the national press over this event. While People's Church grew to be a large force in the community in the 1890s, several of Bartlett's projects were criticized and considered heretical by some of the more conservative Kalamazoo Christians. During the 38th year of her life, Carolyn met Dr. Augustus Warren Crane, a local physician 10 years her junior, when he attended services at the church. Soon, a courtship ensued. The age difference caused many a Kalamazoo eyebrow to arch. According to letters between the two, she was torn between her busy career and marriage. Dr. Crane assured her she would not have to give up her career in order to marry him. On New Year's Eve, 1896, after a musical program at the church, it was announced that Carolyn and Warren would be married forthwith. To the complete surprise of all, except a few close friends, organ music accompanied the couple down the aisle, and the wedding ceremony was performed by Reverend Jenkin Lloyd Jones. These were busy years for Carolyn. She was reported to have health problems of an unknown cause. One board meeting was held in her bedroom due to illness. Her January 1898 report to the congregation stated that she would resign in 1899, which would have been her 10th year at Peoples. Her plan was to study sociology at the University of Chicago and to devote more time to her role as housewife and homemaker. The records show that a power struggle occurred between Crane and the trustees of the church early in 1898. There was a dispute over who had the authority to name the speakers for the Sunday evening services. Carolyn wanted the authority to make the decision. On May 26, 1898, she submitted her resignation, effective June 26, 1898. My health has been so poor as to make it difficult for me to continue at work. And two months ago, I felt obliged to notify the trustees of the church. I must ask release in the near future. That is, at the end of the present church year, June 26th. She continued to be a member and a supporter of People's Church, serving as Sunday school superintendent and on creative committees. By 1900, she had returned to occasional speaking engagements at Unitarian churches in Grand Rapids and other cities, while continuing to write and publish religious articles. By 1901, she was devoting a lot of her time to municipal housekeeping, which included meat hygiene reform and improved health care for poorhouse patients. This dynamic 
energetic woman is described by her biographer, Orion Rickard. As part of the progressive era between 1890 and 1914, an era of civil reform, optimism, practical application of social science theory, and the growth of women's participation in municipal and social reform. In 1913, Dr. and Mrs. Crane decided to adopt two children. Carolyn, then 55 years old, was as enthusiastic as any young mother about her new babies, Bartlett and Juliana. The family spent many happy hours together at their cottage, the Brown Thrush, at Gull Lake. To Carolyn Bartlett Crane, religion and good citizenship were one and the same, the ethical duty of every man and woman. Crane vigorously supported the social gospel movement. Her sermons reveal that she was influenced by the writings of Emerson and Darwin, as well as Reverend Jenkins Lloyd Jones and the Reverend William Channing Gannett, leaders of the liberal movement of the Unitarian Church. They also reveal a strong personal, spiritual insight. The following is an excerpt from one of her essays titled, What of a Day, which was published in September 1895. Those to whom the earth is not consecrated will find their heaven profane, says Martineau. Scarcely is any loss comparable to that loss which we constantly sustain through our insensibility to the miracles of every day. Someone has remarked that if the sun rose but once in a hundred years, all men would believe and worship. The very frequency and faithfulness of the marvel rob us of the sense of the marvelous, and we take the sunrise as we take the daily rounds of the men who renew the carbons of our street lamps without reflection or remark. But perhaps there has come, or will come, to each of us some morning, when with new anointed eyes we see in the common the divine, the memory of which vision will touch every sunrise after with some of that remembered glory of the Lord. Carolyn Bartlett Crane became known across the country as a lecturer and became involved in state and national campaigns to improve society, including divorce law reforms. She was labeled a professional fault finder by her critics and the foremost civic reformer in America by her supporters. In 1933, the YWCA named her the foremost citizen in Kalamazoo. A bas-relief sculpture created by a Chicago artist in 1934 is on display at the Kalamazoo Public Library. In 1985, her name was placed in the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame in Lansing, Michigan. Presently, there is a display in the new Kalamazoo Valley Museum highlighting her many contributions to the community and including a scale model of her prize-winning concept of every man's house. Built in 1924 at 2026 South Westmidge, where it still stands. 